anyone who has driven down North Main Street has seen this sign for Kirchen Woods. But I bet not many people have actually walked through the property. The first problem is, how do you get there? Well, certainly not through Main Street. Just go down Franklin Street till you arrive at Kirchen Lane. There you will see the official entrance to the woods. In April 2006, I went on a guided tour with Bob Kirchen. What better way to learn about the property than from someone who grew up on it? For the next half hour, you will hear Bob tell many of his stories. I returned a couple times to video some more footage. You can tell the difference because it was much greener then than it was in April. So let's start with Bob telling us how it all began. My dad's wishes were to, uh, well, leave 36 acres that were, you know, still had the birds and the, and the flowers and the lady slippers and all the, all the things that were growing here for all those years, just leave it there. So it ended up uh, 36 acres of conservation. I think the town uh, has received 10 more, I think. So there's almost 50 acres there of uh, conservation land. Before he died, he was interested in the people coming and vi visiting and walking on the land and, and seeing the, all the different plants that were there. We sold it in 1974 and he lived to 1986. He was able to see people come and walk on the property and meet people and, and that. He was always interested in plants. He had his own greenhouse and we planted a lot of plants out there. Uh, cow slips and stuff like that in the swamp. Uh, that's an arrowhead that I found when my dad was plowing the garden years ago. I took it to the Museum of Science and they authenticated that it's an arrowhead. I don't know if you can see it. And uh, this is the, the, I found this way up back near a brook and it originally was a, a long spearhead that's been chipped away and made into a tool. This is a scraping tool to, to uh, and you can see where they've chipped it to make a, a point with it. All right, the Boy Scouts built this walkway so you can enter and without getting your feet wet. <laughs> it's a 25 foot wide, 125 foot long right away for a sewer pipe. <laughs> we had a huge well and there's a big tank down in the ground and we used to irrigate about an acre and a half of garden here. Uh, and I had a huge pump here. And if you look over there, you can just see the T-pipe sticking up. But there's a river down under there. And when we dug that, if you lay down on the ground, you could hear the river flowing underneath there. And it's rushing, it, even in the dead of summer. Like in 1955, when we had the dry, dry summer, we still had water in that well. We pumped over 700 gallons a minute out of that to irrigate the garden. We had a huge pump here. Right over here was, as every farm had years ago, was a dump. And if you got down digging in there, there's a 1930 dump truck down in there, and a couple of Model A's, and a 1920-something Buick. <laughs> it's laying in the ground under there. Uh, the Buick was sitting there for years with its wheels up in the air, but it's gone. I think the town cleaned it up. That swale in there, where you can see all the thick stuff. That used to be a pond, and on the other side of that was a dam, and a fellow by the name of Corton, years ago, used to cut ice on that. That's one of his ice-cutting puddles. And uh, when we were kids, you could skate on it, and it was a, a, th a little three-sided shack way on the end of it near the dam, and we, had, we could build a fire in a 50-gallon a, a barrel and stay warm and have a day just having fun. It was a good size area. It was way in there and way over. This brings back some memories that may sound funny to you. That's a corn cob. 
And the raccoons used to come in and raise my, the old man's garden. And Harry used to get mad as can be. And they're just like little kids. They peel down the corn, they break it off, and they take a couple of bites. And then they walked out through the woods here, leaving half-chewed corn that you could sell to the public or eat. They left it behind, and that's, that's, that's what you saw after raccoons raided your garden. This hollow here was a little house when I was a kid. And they had, uh, she had a garden and for years, the, the lilies used to come up and the flowers came up. It's too early in the spring now. But uh, last time I came, some of them still come up. But there was a, a little cabin in here and those people came in the summer to, to enjoy the peace and quiet of the sticks of Redding. <laughs> They never built a foundation, they just had it up on, on rocks. There were four or five piles of rocks and a berm of dirt that kept the wind from blowing in underneath it. In this area here, and there's still a lot of them that moved over a little weird, so it's gotten crowded, but there are a lot of lady slippers in here. And last year, I think, I counted 76 or so in bloom. And they were, they've moved from this area because they've gotten shaded by the pines but they're still in here. And it's too early for them now. It's, they won't come up for a while. I returned to the spot just before Memorial Day weekend and the lady slippers were in bloom. If you use your imagination, you can picture two slippers side by side. It looks like insects like to crawl inside the hollow flower. I did not count 76, but I found a number of lady slippers along the trail. Almost all of this is wild blueberries. And on some good years, we used to pick a lot of good blueberries here. You see the, the greenish shoots here? This is all low bush blueberry, these green ones. And in 1952, a fire came through here. That's why you don't see any big trees. They're all small trees. It burned all the big trees down. And it just almost burnt my father's house down and went across and caught on a field up, up the street and burned all the way to the Ipswich River. And uh, well, George Perry and a few other people, they'll remember it because they fought the fire with me. They had every town within miles around here fighting that. That fire was quite a fire. There was another fire some kids lit that they put out where there's a really burnt up in there, but that's the only thing you have to worry about is in the dead of summer is uh, people up here are starting fires like this little fire right here that somebody had. I think they had a fire here. There was a big well there was a well and it was dug, it was dug out around maybe 12, 15 feet wide and it went down to a, a lower spot and then it went down and was a well and we'll walk up further and his house was right up here and he was a squatter and he lived here um, his whole, well the latter part of his life. Uh, when I was a kid he was still alive. He had a big garden in here. None of these trees were here. And he had a uh, raspberry patch and strawberries and, well, we weren't allowed to raid the garden. <laughs> and actually it looks like trash now, but it's sad. People have thrown their trash in there. Yeah, that was, it, it's small. He, uh, he had quite a family. His porch came out to here. The house was just a little, you know, like one room. The drain off the roof came down and went to that towards his garden, I think. And he used the water to water his garden. Um, he actually had a nice flower garden here. When we were kids, he had tulips and vinker and all kinds of uh, plants. That bloomed in the spring. That was a big tree and he had a grape arbor behind it 
over to one side and he had good grapes and lilacs. These are, uh, they're not blooming yet, but uh, actually it was kind of homey when it was, years ago it was nice. That's the last of them. And he had white and blue lilacs that grew in this area. And he had quite a garden, this was all cultivated. All these stones were taken out of this area when he uh, turned the soil over. That's quite a pile of stones. So somebody has actually come and taken these with a, with a four-wheel drive vehicle and used them in a wall somewhere. And then on the other side of it, down in that area, there's a big cranberry bog there. And they used to pick cranberries on it. And I, I'll take you up to where the brook starts. There's a brook that flows through and they regulated, they regulated the height of the water. And, and they could, you know, flood the bog up if it was gonna be a cold night so the cranberries wouldn't get frosted and then drain it down to pick them. And there was a, another cranberry bog on the other end. And the land was used, you know, I mean, they used it to cut ice on it and everything. Uh, it was, it was quite, quite interesting at that time. To, to have, you know, the property used as, as farmland. It's still here. This brook flowed from a cranberry bog in that direction into another cranberry bog in that direction. And there were little dams along here, and if you could look along in here, there are, were three uh, cutouts not very deep, and they used to run the water into them in the winter and let them freeze, and then they cut ice, and they would drag the ice out of here and put it in a pit that had sawdust in it, and the ice would last all summer. From Texas to Maine, this is a gas line under here, but they had a blast all the way through here. I think that was 1957 that they came through. And they came through here, they, had a, a, they just cut trees and everything. They're 50 foot wide right away. It, it, and my father's property was a, a rectangle and they went right across the longest part of it. <laughs> it was quite a thing to see them uh, lay the pipe. They had a never ending, uh, looked like a, a merry-go-round, a carousel and a dug and they blasted in front of it. And then right behind it, they had a pipe and they welded it all together. And then they had this funny machine that had a tar or something. And it, it actually wound around every section of pipe and came to the weld and stopped until they welded it and then kept going. And then they laid it down in the ground. Now, when they got down in here, they had so much swamp and so much uh, peat that they ended up cutting a whole bunch of trees, good sized trees, and laying them to drive the, uh, the thing that scoops the ground because they, could, they were sinking in on the peat overnight. And so they, they, they made what they call a corduroy road and it went the whole length out to Blueberry Lane from here. And uh, if you dig down there, you still see the old oak, what the trees that they use to run the equipment on so they wouldn't sink into the uh, peat moss. Back on the pipeline, as I call it, the pipeline, and uh, the hill we came in on, walked in on, is over there. That's where we walked down that path. Right. Yeah, now we're on another little rise, and then, as one of the science teachers found out, by walking up here, there's a vernal pool down here. There's a brook that comes out underneath the roots of a tree. It flows right here. It's the, it flows all year round. And when we were kids, we used to drink it. And it comes out, of the, out from under this tree. After they blasted around here, that started to run. That's been running since 1950s. And even in the dry of the summer, if you come and pull the leaves away, there's still a little trickle flowing out from under that tree. After a rainstorm, 
the trickle turns into a stream, and that feeds the vernal pool. If we walk past that stone wall and into there, it's pretty thick now, there's another cranberry bog, and what's that, Van Orden Road, I guess, comes off Forest Street and, and comes into Franklin, and that, that was flooding up the cellars in, in, uh, in that area, and they ended up uh, taking the dam down and, and blowing it out of the way. But they actually used to use the cranberries from that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take you around, because it's all wet in here, out to another road and over and up onto that hill. When we sold the land in uh, 1974 for conservation, they did what well, I guess they call it a geodesic survey, and they put the most beautiful Massachusetts seals with the uh, latitude and longitude and relevance to minutes, in, you know, where it is in the world and they put it in markers and somebody came along very neatly and pried every one of them out and they're all gone. And it's really sad. One of the markers is right here. This is, and this had a big seal right in it. It was about that big around. And that marker told where it was in reference to the world. There's, there is one of the hemlocks that they never cut down. That big one right there, it's all, that's a hemlock. That tree, if you climb to it, to the top, you can look for miles around here. Because this is one of, this, oh, another thing is, uh, they were gonna maybe put the water tower that's down near the high school years ago. This is one of the highest spots in Reading right in here. But that's the grandma. And this is a small hemlock, it's one of hers. And all, you see pines in here, but you see hemlocks. This is a hemlock, or, and that, that, that's part of the original growth that was on the property back when my old man came here. Well, there were enough, so if you didn't know where it was, you were in trouble. You know, I mean, that well there, I almost fell in it one night. I was hunting and it was in the fall and I was walking home and the leaves were floating on the water, and I started to step in it, and I got, you know, went in up to my knee, and I realized, and then that well was very deep. You know, I mean, if I'd have fallen down in it, I'd, it wouldn't have come out, I don't think. <laughs> so they filled it in. The new school up here, yep. that's off Franklin Street, that had a beautiful well in it, and they filled that well in too. Bill Doosnap used to live right in here, and he had a chicken coop back here. And uh, one Halloween, I let his chickens out. <laughs> and uh, a couple of days later, I was down and doing something, and I don't think you've ever seen a chicken catcher, but it's got a wooden handle, and it's a long piece of uh, wire with a hook on it. And you can lay it on the ground and actually, you know, jig the leg of a chicken and catch it. Well, he came down in the yard and told, you know, Harry, they called my father Harry. Harry, he says, you seen any chickens? And my father, I said, no, Bill. He says, well, they let my chickens out on Halloween night. So uh, he was looking for like 35 chickens. So I'm over there <laughs> laughing. My old man came over and got a hold of me and whacked me up against a tree and said, guess who's going to pay for the chickens if he doesn't find them? You go help him find his chickens. That was the end of that joke. <laughs> now we're coming back out onto the, the pipeline again. And the property went over from here over to the cranberry bog edge. And that's the second vernal pool. The other one's in front of it where the tree was. And we were standing up on that hill before. Whoop, there's a snake. Come here, Gilly. Come on. There's a gutter snake. He's out sunning himself. Do you see him? Gutter snake getting a little. Early, early sun. And he's laying in, and I don't know the name of it, but it used to be a very famous Christmas ornament, and the people would rip it up for miles all around. It almost became extinct in New England. 
and they'd make wreaths with it, and it's against the law to do that now. It's sphagnum moss. It's a moss. It's, it's called sphagnum moss. Years ago, they used to put it in the pot with the orchids. Orchids are what they call epiphytes. They stick their roots out, and they don't grow in dirt. They just stick their roots out, and they get what they need from the air. And as a, uh, a medium to put the, the orchid in, you would, you'd take that, chop it up a little, let it dry, and put it in the pot. And every day, just when you hosed it, it would just grab the water, and it would be damp, you know, like through the night until the next day when it would dry out again, and then you water it again or whatever. And you got to know how each plant liked its roots. Did they like it really wet or dry, depending on where it grew, you know, in its natural habitat. But that's what they used to use as sphagnum. And of course, we used to have to buy it. So we knew where it all grew around here. And we came and harvested our own. <laughs> yeah. Are you ha you're having a great day of it, gal. Come on, get out of the puddle, you. <laughs> I got to figure out how we're going to get around here without getting wet. That could be the imprint of a leaf, but uh, just a rock. <laughs> this is rust out in the form. This is what I call rotten stone, or it's an, it's an iron ore, but there's not enough iron in it to really make it worth uh, mining. But this whole area, all the way out to Franklin Street and that, is all iron. It's an iron ore. See this? This is the kind of sand you find at the beach. And in this particular spot, under here, it's all beach sand. It's a very fine, it's damp now, but if it was dry, it would just trickle through your fingers. It's a, it's a beach sand. This old woodchuck den, and he hauled it out. But that's right in some areas you find pockets and uh, we used to make cement with it. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice coarse sand. You can't see it now, but when, when I was a kid, these were rutted roads that they brought horse and wagon on. And that's why a lot of them, when you look down them, there's a spot in the middle that looks like somebody's been walking there. That was the horse pulling the wagon. That was a uh, McCormick plow. Uh, I don't know if you know why it's built the way it is. No. All right, I'll explain it to you. One plow's facing one way and one's the other. Well, when, if you only had one plow, you'd go all the way around the field, make a furrow, come back all the way around, and then make another furrow. You always throw your furrows, always throw your furrows to the same direction. Well, this big old McCormick had huge wheels, there's the axles, there's the axle. And it had great big iron wheels. And what you did is you went down the row of the field, turned around, picked up that plow, and dropped the other plow, and it threw the furrow in the same direction, and you went down. And you went down there, and you picked that one up, it had two levers, the levers right there, and a, a lock on it, and it would lock it. And you could lift, Lift one plow, drop the other, and when you were done plowing, all your furrows were thrown in the same direction. So when you put your harrows to it, you didn't go boom, boom, boom. You just went over and evened it out. And then you could use it. And we used to use it until somebody uh, brought it up here and cut the wheels off it. Driving by Drumlin Farm in Lincoln, I spotted a plow which was just like the one that Bob described. The great big iron wheels are still attached along with the same plows. It's got the hitch, the levers and locks. Well, if it's not the same model, it must be its brother. Here is a map of Reading. The line in the middle is North Main Street. The first conservation sign you come to is for Finneman Ice Pond. That area is connected to Kirchen Woods. The skinny line above is where the woods connects to Main Street. If you travel down Franklin Street to Kirchen Lane, that is where the entrance to the woods are. And we're just across the street 
to the Wood End School. This completes our guided tour of the woods. I will leave you with some scenes I shot in both April and in May.